This has been a great couple of days, and uh, it's like one long bar mitzvah. <laughs> Four days of it. Um, um, I mean, it's, it's rare that one gets to kind of, in some extended way, share their ideas, um, you know, over time, not just kind of a one-shot thing, and that's what's been sort of, for me, really special about it. So today I wanted to uh, take you through some ideas um, uh, that I have about workers and collective action and solidarity. Um, when I think about solidarity, I think of it as a relationship, as a process, as an expression of mutuality, um, of reciprocal identification based on horizontal relations of equality. Um, that's how I've always sort of thought about it. Um, that's how I thought about it when I wrote this book, Cultures of Solidarity, some 25 years ago now. Um, but also when I was a union militant before that and as I became a sociologist, as a graduate student. Uh, um, the book that I wrote, which began as a, a PhD thesis, uh, focused on the social world of labor and the culture of workers and the labor movement within the context of the United States. There's a lot that has changed since the publication of that book, both in the social world, that is the world out there, not out there, um, that's just <laughs> spectacular there, but um, in the world out there, uh, that is the world of workers and of the labor movement and the nature of the forces arrayed against the, the labor movement here. Um, but there are also things that have changed in here, in my head, um, in the ways that I perceive things out there. Uh, the categories uh, I used um, then uh, seem sometimes problematic now um, and limiting. Uh, and I've tried over the course of the years since that, that book and anything I've worked on in relation to labor, I've realized is to push back in some ways or push against some of the limitations that uh, that, that argument kind of presented for me and that I presented to it. Um, you know, in the book I did with Kim Voss um, in 2004, um, that was certainly the case, although that wasn't framing what we were doing. I have to say, I mean, in all of the discussions we had, um, I realize now that I was sort of, um, in a sense, pushing back against ways in which I had seen earlier. Um, uh, and most of all, I was also trying to figure out how to sort of work with Bourdieu in the context of work on workers in the U.S. So in some sense, it's been a response in, and you know, in the book and in uh, articles and, and essays I've written, they're on some level, in terms of labor, a response to a kind of silent dialogue with Bourdieu um, along two basic lines, I think. One is to try to extend a social map of the labor movement and its tendencies, both uh, individual and institutional. Um, so for example, there's a chapter in the book Hard Work that I did with Kim Voss called Bureaucrats, Strongmen, Militants, and Intellectuals. And a lot of people sort of, when they had seen the book, you know, they said, we like parts of the book, but what is that for? Um, and I realized I didn't have an immediate response. I was sort of trying to flesh out, you know, in, in, in terms that the labor movement is not simply those um, figures and agents <coughs> who I analyzed in cultures of solidarity, that it's more complicated than that. And I tried to, in some sense, pull out that complication um, or, or, or present that complication as complicated. Um, the second thing I think I've been doing over these years when I've written about labor, and that is to develop and extend uh, the symbolic dimensions of the labor movement. Um, I began that in that book, Cultures of Solidarity, and I f feel as though it, I always felt as though it could have been sort of developed more, that it hadn't been tapped for its symbolic value. Um, and so a lot of the things I've worked on um, have been interested in the interpenetration of the symbolic and material practices that labor in, in, engages in. Um, and that's kind of what I want to talk about today, um, th that sort of dimension. So I want to sort of do a, a bit of a bricolage and pull together certain different ideas that I've started with. I've never worked them sort of together, and I want to start trying to work them together a bit here. Um, <clears throat> a couple of words of background um, about, I don't presume everybody knows this culture of solidarity. But basically, it began as a critique of traditional approaches to the idea of class consciousness, the, its concept, arguing that ideas and attitudes had to be considered in the context of behavior, of class behaviors, that analysts needed to pay uh, attention to the chemistry of workers in collective action, that class consciousness is not simply, should not simply be a study of workers in this static 
uh, disembodied form, but that in the lives that they lead, including those lives when all hell breaks loose and workers engage collectively together, those rare moments. It was a perspective pushing back um, uh, at the time against the belief of, in fact, many ap academics and also radical activists that people, or workers in this case, need to have an intellectual or ideological grasp, a correct line on, on society before being able to change it, um, that in the process of change and crisis, that ideas are more fluid than other times, and that collective action also creates the context in which new ideas can emerge, change, and be subject to scrutiny and renegotiation collectively, in a collective, and I would uh, add intersubjective and contingent process. Uh, uh, it was a push against sociological surveys that dominated in my uh, y younger days learning sociology. Um, and I wanted to emphasize the dynamic element also in Marx's famous statement about class consciousness, whereby a class in itself becomes, through struggle and uniting and constituting, a class for itself. I wanted to focus on the fused group that is created in the process of struggling and uniting and constituting, but not only the group that is made, but that can also be unmade in, 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 in those processes. Um, the, the book was based on three case studies uh, uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, um, fairly mundane, everyday sort of negotiations turn into something more, and in the process uh, we can see uh, a new dimension of social reality emerge in that process uh, that, may not be, um, uh, that may not be apparent um, at other times. That is, the element of social drama was central to these. Um, in each of the cases, uh, daily life was suspended as a situation of crisis necessitated that workers step outside of the daily round of their workaday lives with the routines and responsibilities, the diversions, divisions and prejudices of everyday life, the individualism, and the things to be endured. Um, although to endure is also to act in the world um, in the context of crisis um, one feels as if that en the endurance is suddenly no longer necessary and one can sort of push back and act, be agents in the world. Um, in each case study, like all such struggles of, uh, that workers and, and other subordinated groups um, constantly have to confront, is that workers are, were faced with an assault on their dignity, their economic livelihoods and their future, which raised the stakes considerably of collective action in this context. These social dramas, is a, a term I didn't use, but it's, it's, you know it probably from Victor Turner's uh, uh, expression of the incorporation into dominant cultures uh, that breaks the flow, the serial flow of everyday life in such crises, the exigencies of daily life um, create a situation of crisis that requires a new repertoire you know, of, of practices, of meanings, of definitions of the situation, as symbolic interactionists would say. Uh, crisis creates the occasion um, for new questions, new forms of adaption and new circumstances, um, uh, enveloping everything in a condition of ur urgency, or can, huh? that the, at the group or collective level can necessitate expressions of solidarism because of the, the, the urgency uh, 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 that the context creates, creating a new resource, a collective kind of efficacy that may not have been there before. That's, um, on some level, something I missed in that book entirely was that I looked at these situations of crisis as expressions that could create new forms of culture, new co emergent cultures, um, but did not spend much time, and this is partly to do, I think, with the kind of neo-Marxism that I was working with and pressured by in my sort of sub my academic subconscious, um, um, to not want to focus on the ways in which that crisis can operate um, uh, in really opposite kinds of ways as well. Um, the crisis of, you know, of unemployment or of union busting, even of housing foreclosures, imposes itself deeply into the, the psyche of individuals and groups with the potential of dropping the veil of, yes, on the one hand, the potential of dropping the veil that drapes the social world with hope and aspirations and dreams um, at an individual and sometimes a collective level and can therefore be clarifying of people's reality. Um, uh, as Lloyd Warner, with reference to the strike in the book Yankee City some 75 years ago, the best of all possible moments to achieve insight into the life of a human being is during a fundamental crisis 
when he is faced with grave decisions which can mean ruin and despair or success and happiness. In such crises, men reveal what they are and often betray their innermost secrets in a way they never do and never can when life moves placidly and easy. If this is true for the study of men and women, it applies even more forcefully to the study of men and women in groups. It is when all hell breaks loose that the powerful forces which control and organize human society um, are revealed. Um, it's, a very, it's a very interesting uh, formulation, it seems to me. Um, and it's true enough, although crises or the perceptions of crises can also serve as an occasion for imposing new constraints on workers' action and others, um, as you well know here in Madison, um, from the kind of shock and awe that was visited upon workers here um, uh, and that was used. Um, uh, Naomi Klein's um, um, shock doctrine is a good example of the, uh, the use of crises to impose re new restraints and new, uh, and new uh, um, oppressions um, uh, on everyday life. <clears throat> crisis can serve as the ground from which myth um, is cultivated and that can release the social imagination I would argue myth is important to me in some of this um, we tend to see it in limited terms sometimes um, the expansion of the social imagination I think is a crucial element if workers are to mount a def any defense against a sustained employer assault especially if, if you think about the four decades long assault visited upon workers in the United States um, it's going to require a huge kind of mythological transformation to even begin to approach uh, the, the atomization that has occurred and depoliticization. Um, I think it requires political work um, and also analytical work on the part of social scientists to create a durable and effective myth-making apparatus. Until now, social scientists, when they've paid attention at all to the labor movement, have mostly paid attention to the labor movement's corporeal forms, its proportions, its organizational structure, its institutional leverage, its political efficacy, its membership characteristics, etc., with very much less attention paid to the, its evocative dimensions, its place in the symbolic vocabulary of society. However, I think it can be reasonably argued that the strength and efficacy of its embodied forms depends to a large degree on its capacity to evoke something larger than itself. That is to spawn and sustain a sacred narrative, a transcendent myth. In fact, one could push this point even further by suggesting that the most fundamental reality of the labor movement is its mythic quality. Not myth that sustains social order, and myths do that. Roland Barthes writes about myth many years ago um, in these terms. Um, and I don't mean myth as a, quote, fabulous narration, an untrustworthy or deliberately false construction that obscures the field of vision. Raymond Williams kind of put it in those terms back in the uh, 70s. Rather, I mean myth as an enabling and mobilizing force, quote, a means of acting on the present, as George Sorel put it over a century ago now in his classic essay on the general strike. Solidarity has been the foundational myth of labor movements everywhere, a potent sacred narrative with remarkably transcendent qualities. Under certain conditions and at certain moments, demonstrations of solidarity have been capable of summoning powerful forces in the social world, in groups, in collective activities, in organizational forms. These forces can, in turn, produce extraordinary degrees of selflessness and collective identification, in other words, solidarity. That is, it's not so tautological. Bold displays of solidarity can demonstrate that the seemingly impossible might be possible and thus beget a broader and bolder expression of solidarity. This is all the stronger, I would suggest, in a society rife with social division and group mistrust, where there's a constant scramble to get ahead and stay afloat, and where amidst the inevitable disappointments and relentless atomization, solidarity can represent an unusually potent mythic theme. That is, in the United States, it's particularly sort of open on some level to this alternative narrative precisely because of its, its, the prominence of individualism and atomization, I would suggest. Um, within the regime of industrial relations in the US, a system established and designed, I argued in that book, and Kim Voss and I kind of developed that part of the analysis, um, that is, the, whole, the entire regime of industrial relations in the US has been designed to channel and domesticate social conflict expressions of class, working class solidarity. However, 
are capable of charming the social world, that is lifting it, uh, that which uh, might have been a mundane event at one moment, a meeting, a grievance, a contract negotiation, can raise it to a higher and almost sacred level in the next. An individual voice can become a collective chant. Her grievance is suddenly transformed into our protest. A picket line becomes the site, uh, can become the site of a powerful moral crusade. The term labor metaphysic, the term that used to be employed derisively against Marxists to indicate their departure from reality and rationality, um, is actually a term that seems to quite reasonably express an important dimension of collective action, that labor metaphysic. What I'm underlining um, in, this, in these remarks is the need and the, actually the necessity of the labor movement to recover and create a mythic, its mythic status requiring the representation as well as the embodiment of solidar solidarism in its actions, its organizational forms, and the relations it has to social groups and institutions beyond it. Group formation and collective action are social representations that have a strong symbolic dimension, after all. So while they may represent a certain social reality, uh, one thinks of the working class, the, t the term working class, is. And, and its reality is never fully made in reality, even uh, where its material foundations can be objectively delineated, it must be made symbolically in, the, in language, in mental construction, in the ways it's represented by those of us who represent the social world, whether social scientists or journalists or activists or politicians. The labor movement is also a construction. It is a reality that is always uneven. It's in flux. It's never fully formed. It's always a point of contention, and is thus always partly allegorical. And where social groups must contend for power and influence, and, and just basic recognition, in a hostile social universe, like unions do in the United States, they must constantly demonstrate uh, their efficacy and their potential. <coughs> Not only their potential and efficacy to those who um, um, who've had no experience of unionism before in a union organizing drive where workers have no sense of the possibilities of negotiating a contract and what that will mean for them and the collective action that can flow from that, um, but also union workers whose experience of solidarity must constantly be reinforced and enacted in practice. Demonstrations of this, demonstrations are really uh, uh, just that. They demonstrate both to participants and potential participants friend and foe alike, not what a group is at any given time, but what it is in potential, what it is potentially, with respect to mobilization, commitment, and social disruption. This is often the basis for, dis for those disparities and those disputes that take place between activists and authorities over the true numbers of participants or marchers in a demonstration. Not only are the numbers objects of contention, but so is the collective bodily pose of the demonstrators. They're either militant or peaceful. They're disruptive or orderly. Their visual symbols and slogans um, uh, can be reassuring or provocative. And that matters, it seems to me, um, for how a group represents itself to itself, but also to groups outside, and also to those on the other side. Um, and it's, it's a dimension of uh, social reality that it seems that, to me that the labor movement has really lost in its, um, uh, in its uh, well, for very complex reasons. Um, uh, that we can talk about later for sure. Um, <clears throat> this is partly all of this, this question of the symbolic demonstrations um, of a group, its forms, are partly a product of the representational struggle itself, that is the goals, the organizing styles, the particular circumstances of collective action that workers may find themselves in, and partly a product of the social backgrounds and, participants of, of particip uh, and positions of participants what and how much they have to lose or gain by the form of their participation and the way it gets represented and their position or of relative security or insecurity in the labor market, for example, will, uh, will determine a lot about what a group can, how the group can operate on this stage. In other words, the symbolic character of a movement, like the labor movement, is reflected and formed in the nature of the vehicles that advance it at any given time and place. And so a key part of the work of mythical construction involves the social act of assembly, bringing a group together in its, in its forms. Um, uh, uh, and 
kinds of what I've been talking about. The second kind of social act at work in the process of the construction of the myth is the process of invocation. And this, is, uh, this comes largely from Bourdieu's con uh, questions and, and analyses of the rise of you know, groups more generally, <coughs> but in which leaders and spokespersons perform the act of symbolic construction of the group by referring to the group, by talking about it, by using, the langu by using language which refers to the group. That's, that's constructing the group in its own, on its own terms, even though it's not simply assembling the group, it's assembling the symbolic vocabulary of the group. Um, um, it is a process that involves leaders and activists at various levels of a movement, um, spokespersons for the movement, and those um, who are, in a sense, on, uh, um, um, at a second tier of leadership, uh, journalists uh, and academics and intellectuals as well, as well as the institutions, periodicals, um, think tanks, academic centers like the Haven Center um, can be thought of in just the, these terms, in fact. Um, f and foundations, both established institutions and those that would challenge those established institutions to seek an established place in the world of being a spokesperson and a, and a, and a, and a, and a visible analyst. That can lend spokespersons sufficient legitimacy in, in the process. That is sim uh, sufficient symbolic weight or symbolic capital to be heard in, in that public uh, setting. As well as the relationship between leaders and the group in formation that they seek to lead by speaking in their name. In other words, it is a process that places attention on the social production of the leader, the spokesperson, the leader of the group, who once granted the authority of invocation, is able to invoke and thereby establish the identity, and collect the identity of the collectivity, and thus participating in an important part of the process by which a group is brought into being as an identifiable and recognizable entity. In an obverse way, groups can also be disappeared. They can be, in a sense, erased from the social map as well. While U.S. corporations and the state um, have worked closely over many decades in the United States to domesticate the post-war labor movement, basically taking the movement out of the labor movement almost entirely, under the regime of neoliberalism, the worker herself has been erased from the U.S. social imagination, I would argue. I would argue this with Kim Voss um, in, our, in our book. Um, um, along with the sustained assault on unions. That is, not only unions themselves, but the worker as, a, as an imaginary figure in, our, in, in social life, um, as well as the organizations of workers. It's been underway for some four decades, this process, um, whereby the institutional dominance of big business in the U.S. has been accompanied by a seemingly impossible trick at the level of the symbolic. That is, at the same time as the real exploitation of workers was being greatly intensified over the last decades in the workplace, the worker was being made to practic practically disappear from the public imagination as a socioeconomic subject. In the place of the worker appeared the consumer who largely took over the role as the principal subject and object of economic practice in the society, and in whose name a host of traditional economic regulations have been systematically overturned. In the U.S., this symbolic shift was both reflected and accompanied, on the one side, by a steady inflation of the social rights of the consumer, the freedom to choose, the uh, freedom to obtain easy, con easy credit, freedom to shop at all hours on any and every day, to have virtually anything and everything delivered directly to one's door with no waiting, and to generally be granted uh, an almost absurd degree of, quote, convenience with regard to retail trade. On the other side, this symbolic shift has been a, uh, at the expense of the systematic dissolution of the social rights of the worker, the spread of contingency and precarious forms of labor arrangements, the sharp decline in wages, the literal a pauperization of the U.S. working class over the last uh, two decades, more than that, but two decades in particular, the overwork and forced overtime, the surveillance of workers on the job, you know, two-thirds of employers monitor, as many of you know, uh, the email traffic of their, of their employees, um, the reduction of the very few mandated social benefits that actually existed here, um, and the effective loss of the right to strike through the use of replacement workers, which has literally destroyed the right to strike 
um, uh, at least for the moment. Um, uh, along with widespread and state-sanctioned anti-unionism. The central point I'm suggesting here is that it is not a matter of the spheres of production and consumption that stand in inverse proportion to one another, but that they can be seen as reciprocal, reciprocally generating conditions. This mo the relationship most clearly is observed, as Kim Voss and I mentioned in uh, um, uh, our book, um, with the practices of the U.S. retail giants of consumption, Toys R Us, Walmart, and such giant mega stores, companies that represent high volume, low cost, quote, selling factories, driven to sell goods cheaply that are produced by cheap international labor in the manufacturing phase, which are then sold usually by contingent, part-time, low-wage, non-union labor in a hyper-rationalized retail phase of the process, and the situation, though, of labor is central here, for while the four main pillars of Walmart's success, for example, have been identified as, one, its successful application of advanced technology, second, its logistical flexibility, third, its reliance on imported goods, and fourth, its employment of non-union labor, in fact, the conditions of, for the first three are essentially made possible by the degree of manipulability, read flexibility, facilitated by the fourth that is the use of non-union labor, which has no voice. Walmart, a 200 plus billion dollar empire, whose annual sales sur well surpass those of General Motors, not only maintains a huge low, huge, low wage, non-union labor force of its own, um, was it 1.6 million now? I'm not even sure the number. Something like 1.6 million in the US. Um, but because of that, it's also capable of affecting the conditions, that is its gigantis gigantism, um, uh, allows it to affect the conditions for labor at its 65,000 companies that supply it. So, by demanding that its suppliers meet specified low costs and its gargantuan sales allow it to make those kind of demands, Walmart can exert powerful downward pressure on wages and benefits across entire industries or regions. Since low-wage workers require an availability of low-cost goods, a company like Walmart is essentially able to create the conditions in production that simultaneously generate the demand for itself as a means of consumption. This is the sort of the other side of the Fordist, the perfect circle of Fordism, right? Uh, this is the race to the bottom that people talk about. Meanwhile, within the domain of consumption, household savings rates have dropped to zero. The annual bankruptcy rate rose sevenfold between 1980 and 2005. Um, in the late 1990s, the last time I saw this, the credit card industry was mailing 2.5 billion solicitations to annual, to annually to American households. Um, uh, um, now, this, these are American households already uh, inundated with promotional mailings, electronic and televisual images, product placement and everything, they, any dramatic event they watch on TV. Um, the point being simply that the pressures to consume um, have become almost as fierce as the pressures that workers face at work. While the slogan, the customer is always right, uh, uh, once saw the consumer elevated to a sovereign position in the neoliberal social imagination, along, I would say, uh, to this, the taxpayer, replacing the citizen actually within the political realm, the worker was made to disappear. One could argue until two years ago, <laughs> when seemingly in an instant and with little warning, at least to the rest of us, maybe not to you, Madison, Wisconsin became, on some level, the center of the social universe. And not only in the US, um, but throughout much of the world. Um, I'm not overdoing it. I'm not just sort of playing to the audience here. Um, but when I was in, in Europe, people asked, where is this Madison? They want to know. Madison, Wisconsin? They're expecting Chicago or New York or San Francisco or Berkeley, you know? And suddenly there's Madison. And it, it, um, it put Madison on the map in a certain way. Um, uh, um, as part of a nationwide assault on labor rights and public sector unionism. That is, you know, this was not some isolated uh, uh, action on the part of uh, your Governor Walker. It was a, a part of a national uh, initiative on the part of the right and, and uh, 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 organized corporations. Um, uh, after decades of union busting in the private sector, the assault was leveled at the public sector. By slashing labor rights, um, uh, the governor of Wisconsin helped illuminate 
and this is the irony, obviously, by slashing labor rights, um, it illuminated the importance of labor rights for millions of Americans, thereby on some level reviving a labor movement symbolically in the very act of destroying it in material terms. But organizing um, work goes on, uh, that is, and it develops. Um, it's not simply in these moments of crisis um, that uh, explosions, in, in a sense, raise the labor movement as a symbolic sort of creature. Um, but work goes on on a daily basis, as we know, um, and in new spheres of mobilization, not only the old. The public presence of uh, labor is manifested uh, on, at the grassroots level, something that was noticeable to me. I spent uh, you know, a week, as maybe some of you did, at the U.S. Social Forum in 2010, and um, I'd like to offer up some uh, observations um, about that. Um, uh, what was represented there at the Social Forum in Detroit, um, it was June 2010, it was a gathering of over 15,000 left activists from around the country, from a wide range of organizations, no, no, a range of organizations, I wouldn't say wide, were gathered to, quote, continue the spirit of the World Social Forums by holding strategic discussions, quote, building relationships and collaborations across movements, and by deepening commitments to international solidarity and common struggle. Some of this was surely accomplished over those five days in Detroit. Um, at the same time, it was also a fabulously vibrant get-together. It was simply, a, as, as a gathering, it was quite remarkable. Um, it included a spirited march of over 10,000 through downtown Detroit that was loud, it was brimming with militancy and anger and movement and color. The color could be seen in both the brightly colored shirts worn by various factions and groups and in the various colors of the people marching together. The many forums and workshops and panels reflected the same spirit. The Excluded Workers Congress, for example, was one of over two dozen people's movement assemblies at the forum. Several hundred people gathered from organizations like the Domestic Worker Alliance, the Taxi Alliance, the Alliance for Guest Workers, the National Day Laborers Organizing Network, along with many others, including groups of restaurant workers and farm workers, um, and various local worker centers from all across the country that support immigrant workers in a range of ways. With little distinction evident between members of the audience and the panelists on the stage, the political rhetoric of this event was both punctuated by expressions of international solidarity, calls for racial justice, and demands for inclusion. This is the stance reflected throughout the five days. In general, the cultural tenor of the social forum was youthful and countercultural, with a vibrant atmosphere and ecolo with, with atmosphere, with ecological concerns and global issues represented in a range of ways, as well as a hall of literature tables occupied by a wide range of left groupings of, of all kinds, as you can imagine. Of also new age practitioners and various kinds of activity, there were therapists there, and you know, I mean, there was a range of groups and organizations. The forum drew a strong representation of workers from non-union low wage service industries, many of whom were women and Latina and Asian and black. They were the excluded workers, a status that was celebrated by the organizers and political sort of leaders, um, uh, and put forward as a dominant representation of the grassroots left. But where were the included workers, if these were the excluded workers? What does it mean, then, to be included, in fact, when the conditions of inclusion, stable jobs, unions able to secure higher wages, a range of social benefits, have been under sustained assault <clears throat> as they have been in the United States? And if the included are becoming increasingly excluded themselves, what interest is served by upholding that distinction at all, either ideologically or sociologically speaking? <coughs> In Detroit, this was Detroit, after all, and there were almost no visible signs of auto workers anywhere. Um, now, the, auto, the ranks of auto workers have shrunk, for sure, but there are still tens of thousands in, in Michigan. Um, uh, there were no uh, uh, large contingents of, I mean, I saw no representation of UAW, no contingents, no, and um, this was in June of 2010, in October, I attended a rally in Washington organized by the UAW, by the AFL-CIO, 
by uh, La Raza, by a large LBGT organization, I can't think of the name, um, um, by the NAACP, sort of the li left liberal sort of establishment, where there was 100,000 workers, also e multinational, multiracial, um, with thousands, I have to say, auto workers present, um, all sitting on the lawn of the, the mall in Washington, listening to rather placid speeches by political leaders from the Democratic Party, largely. Um, when you looked upon the, uh, uh, the scene, it was a beautiful day uh, in October, um, uh, it was a picnic. You know, that was the, that, that's the image that I keep in my head. It was like a picnic. People were there, they're eating food, they're gathering together, it was wonderful in a certain way. All the militancy that I had experienced and uh, felt in Detroit was gone. It was a, this was a different universe in some ways, um, in, in, uh, in, in, these, in symbolic terms. The, now, the social forum in Detroit was basically invisible in the national media. There was, uh, um, it played no role in national politics. I didn't hear it mentioned. It was not, the New York Times didn't mention, nor did any of the uh, television networks that I'm aware of. Um, groups comprising the grassroots left, however, are active in hundreds of communities across the U.S., working to build power at a local level along largely democratic lines, and trying to expand and generalize this by creating networks and coalitions between groups and social space. I have some really quite good informants um, who are quite in the center of a lot of this, and um, some also who fund that I've, I've been talking to, and they've filtered a lot of sort of internal materials that are really quite interesting in terms of the strategies. And it's, it's quite a vibrant sort of movement that none of us have, or many of us have not heard of. Um, they can accomplish tangible things, these groups, for instance, the Domestic Workers United has made significant progress toward establishing a law in New York State that has given, at least uh, tentatively, 200,000 domestic workers the most basic labor standards, mandated overtime pay, protection from discrimination, the notice of termination, and other protections. Taken together, the strength of the different groups that comprise this grassroots left is their autonomy and a pragmatic militancy that mobilizes aggressively toward um, uh, uh, toward concrete, um, uh, definable goals, um, and a pragmatic militancy that mobilizes, uh, I just said that, while, while bringing, I'm sorry, bringing groups together to create uh, larger networks. Um, uh, uh, weakness is that these groups operate with a somewhat limited social imagination that I would argue too easily adheres to a political stance whose highest social ambition is to include the excluded within a set of arrangements that are increasingly less and less tenable for anyone. That is, what does it mean to want to include the excluded um, uh, in a pyramid that is just as strict and uh, rigid and more so than it, has, uh, than it was 30 years ago? Um, now, this, is, this new worker organizing um, has huge strengths. Um, it draws upon Alinsky-like traditions of organizing focusing on the possibility of achieving uh, short-term goals to sustain participation and involvement, um, uh, 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 basically more or less explicitly foregoing sort of the pie in the sky, fundamental social change as a kind of ideological sort of uh, framework or banner, in favor of an overarching uh, goal of social justice. These are groups and activities that organize low-wage, often contingent workers, in the most <coughs> marginal of industries, car wash workers and uh, in laundries and uh, bakeries and restaurants among taxi drivers. Most of you know some of this. Um, they organize around ethnicity and community. Um, and workers are drawn to these organizations on the basis of their ethnic ties and their communities uh, rather than industry and occupation. Um, that is both a strength and a weakness. It provides an opening into these, or, these centers of organizing where workers have been traditionally excluded, but it also means that ties to other workers um, are not forged almost in, by, uh, almost in principle. These grassroots organizations in Detroit were able to bring large numbers of working class people of color to Detroit, a fact noted throughout the week. But there seem to be very few white working class people present in general. 
the whites in attendance, and I didn't do this systematically, but from, you know, I talked to the people there and they felt sort of the same thing, that the whites in attendance were mostly educated members of the middle class, included organizers, act, some activists for sure, and representatives of the philanthropic organizations that are increasingly moving in to the void to, to su support these groups. Although, I have to say, the labor movement is play, does play some role here. Um, and I'm, more and more I'm seeing sort of some of those ties, although I'm not sure what that actually means. I mean, it's, that's hard to know. Uh, it's hard for me to know. They may have contributed to a visual sense of the diversity present, but white working class people were not represented in Detroit, and nor had they been, according to Jackie Smith and others, in the previous social forum in Detroit in 2007. Um, uh, uh, she and a group have been uh, surveying the, the social forums uh, in the U.S. The head of one key organization on the grassroots left, who was seen as a sharp analyst of movement building, offered his solution to the problem of the relative absence of white workers in a movement attempting to build social power. His solution was that, quote, white folks need to go out and organize some poor white folks, which is, I think, a common perspective in a movement whose vision is filtered through a lens um, of identity politics with what I would argue is a somewhat myopic view that elevates to a political principle the very racial separation that must be overcome to create solidarity the foundation for any just society, any movement. And for the labor movement, this has to be a key part of the process, a key actor in the process. Above all, I think, I'll just say, that the left is weak in general in the US because it must survive in a political culture dominated by the largest corporations on the planet. That is the most overreaching, most important sort of point. But to an extent, it is also, but to some extent, it is also weakened by the self-imposed limits of its own social horizons. In, in effect, the, uh, questions of inclusion and exclusion have supplanted a language of exploitation. And that language of exploitation, we can go back to the historical dynamics by which that took place and we, uh, in the United States. We, we all know a piece of, pieces of that story. Um, but it has weakened the possibility, it seems to me, to construct a mythical uh, reality uh, for the labor movement practical myth. So I would suggest um, an expansion of this social imagination is an absolutely crucial element um, for labor power in the United States, requiring, a political, um, requiring political work and the work of sociology also to create a durable and effective myth-making apparatus. Um, I think I'm going to stop because um, I'm going to stop, um, but I can respond to all kinds of uh, thoughts and reactions and complaints. Thank you. Yeah. So in, in moments of crisis, what yeah. determines what's up for grabs and what's not up for grabs? Good question. It's exactly the dynamic that exists to some degree in everyday life, right? I mean, those who have a, a purchase, but there's a new kind of form, there's a new sort of... Um, in the course of collective action, there's a new sort of capital that gets introduced into the mix. It's not the capital of authority necessarily. It's the capital. It's a capital that goes along with challenging th those who are willing to kind of raise issues that those who are in positions of power have not. So that the labor, so that labor leadership suddenly, and those of you who've sort of watched some of this unfold in different situations, you know, labor leaders who uphold the social contract or uphold um, the integrity of uh, the contract, um, suddenly they have nothing to say to uh, a group of workers who engage in, say, a wildcat strike. Um, they have nothing to say because their position and their, their authority is based on the integrity of a contract that workers um, are violating. So my uh, idea is that um, um, the vehicle for a kind of uh, counter-narrative uh, um, is Is in, in, in that case, invested in those who are willing to challenge in an organized way those, uh, uh, those in positions of, of authority. Um, what determines that is sometimes uh, uh, spontaneous. It's sometimes uh, 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 contingent on, um, yeah, one would want to, I mean, and um, in fact, um, if I go back and think about 
you know, the case studies that I did in, in my book on cultures of solidarity, which was kind of trying to deal with this issue. You know, one of the kind of problems with it is that um, I didn't, hadn't done a kind of um, um, a long and detailed study of what sort of predisposed some workers to push themselves into positions of power or not. You know, I have a dynamic that I can understand about how the conditions of struggle um, create un uh, 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 create layers of participation, but not what predisposed uh, some workers to operate um, uh, timidly and others to operate with a certain amount of collective courage. So I can't really, um, I don't have a definitive uh, sense of that, but there's a kind of new, um, uh, in, labor act, in labor action, it's governed by a set of rules. It's governed by a set of um, uh, rules invested in the contract and in, in, in the laws of in, industrial relations, um, in property, and to violate that um, creates a kind of new opening for a new sort of source, a new resource that becomes apparent suddenly. And that resource is not, uh, um, it, it's, it's not external to the field, it's produced in reaction to it. The, but that resource is a willingness to challenge um, uh, the rules. Um, and um, you know, some of that is a collective process, uh, but I think some, I think individuals are also predisposed to that. Um, um, but that's what I don't have a good sort of analysis of, I feel like. Is that, yeah, yeah. So if that's sort of actually, I want to ask about this forum of 2010. Yeah. Because I think in 2010, neither those people, and I don't quite understand what excluded means in that context, but right. neither those excluded workers nor the labor movement knew that the right was deeply plotting to do what it did in 2011. Um, the, at 2011, the, here. At, the, 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 if you look at websites, Right. In the summer of 2010, yep. the, all these right-wing think tanks were absolutely plotting right. to go after public sector workers, understanding yes. that they were going to wipe out the core of the American labor movement and with it destroy the Democrats' constituents. And they're totally clear about it. I don't know how we all missed it, but <coughs> Walker stuff did not come out of nowhere. It was completely sure. being discussed by the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Institute, all those mm -hmm. institutes. Mm -hmm. So if you attended a meeting today, wouldn't right. labor movements be, it looks to me as if right now American labor leaders are totally recognizing that they're in dire straits. And they're in a very different place than they would have been. I think so. I think that's exactly why you, individual unions are now supporting some of the excluded workers groups. In some yeah, sense, but, I, and but it seems them. to me that that's yeah. something that you need to think about in your analysis, that mm -hmm. the moment that you were looking at was a pretty self-satisfied sure. moment that auto ballot looked like it had worked. Mm -hmm. Unions were feeling like they had Obama in choice. Mm -hmm. After 2010, not only that they lost in so many state houses, but also they got hammered in mm -hmm. Wisconsin and mm -hmm. Michigan. Mm -hmm. you know. mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. Yes, no, yeah. I think you're right. right. I think you're absolutely right that that dynamic and, and does sorry, shift if, things. If, if you want to build some of that into your analysis and think about what it is that pushes labor to start taking this stuff more seriously. Yes, yes. Well, my focus has been in this these remarks on the kind of collective self-satisfaction of the grassroots left in thinking, well, we have this great deal of diversity, and there's this energy, which is all true, um, but the links um, uh, to workers beyond have not been, sort of, has been very, was very little attempt to sort of make those links. And those are the hard links. You know, racism and the separation of communities, the physical separation of communities, makes huge differences. But that's the problem that sort of we face, it seems to me, on the left, and, and the labor movement faces, is how to bridge those gaps. Um, and so, <clears throat> so I don't want to ratify yeah. the, the, the gaps, is my point. But that it, the other side of it is, what is the, you know, how does the labor movement respond in 2011, uh, once it's clear that this is a national effort to, uh, and they begin to reach out um, across these traditional divisions, I would say. Which is something they've been doing for a little while, but this is different, I think. Yeah. I think they're much more desperate. Yeah, they're more, that's exactly right. Yeah. Is a, uh, in terms of the evolution of, of the media and the coincidence of that in this time, would yeah. you say that, I mean, in your, the storytelling, the narrative tends to <clears throat> that perhaps greater collective story when there is a <coughs> of collective information. I mean, 
and I, on some level, I'm thinking about columnists. I'm thinking about the, the journalists who, uh, in a, in a, have a, a larger readership. And we coincided with a time where that really collapsed, and to me, it's kind of an interesting phenomenon, even here, of the uprising. That uh, you know, I can't really point to a single journalist who, who, who grabbed a, a, a story that was under the surface and, and brought it out and kept it going. Unlike the local media, you mean? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking yeah. mostly well on the national media. I mean, national media it certainly happened, and I, I could be corrected on this, but I think the ba my basic point, I think, or question for your work is how to how do you analyze media in that sense, and mm -hmm. is it true? I mean, there's a book that's just come out. It's the first sort of nuts and bolts book about the uprising by two journalists who I think were overwhelmed by virtue of there being so few to cover it from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Mm -hmm. And they get very caught up in the Twitter story, how many tweets there were and this and that. Uh, and it's interesting, the, the phenomenon itself and the extent and depth of it. But still, as somebody who participated in it, the story is missing. What so, was their narrative, as they tell it, look, roughly? What was the storyline that they provide? Well, I haven't finished it, but I would say that you know the book I'm talking about. No, it's, who is it? It's, uh, it's Jason, Jason Stein, Stein and cool. the other co-author, Marley. Yeah, and it's uh, it's got a very plain you know name, and it's from the University of Wisconsin Press. Um, I mean, all the other books have been pretty much collections of, uh, of short. I'd say it's short essays. John Nichols might have written something, but that's the John Nichols. Book John's the John. I mean, he's a great example of somebody who. I mean, he captured the left, but he, I don't see him as having told stories that actually drove the, uh, you know, I think he was ahead of the story as a thinker and, or as a participant in some way, but he wasn't a journalist in a, in the, in the, in a, in a sense of, of somebody who's both muckraking, who's discovering some stuff that's important, and telling workers stories that rise above it. So anyway, I, I don't mean. I, That's right. I, I but you, can I just say he he he's the one who I know from national television. Right. Right. And he was giving a storyline. Right. That was really quite counter, I thought, to uh, the kind of dominant sort of story. He was pointing out, you know, the um, the assault on, on public sector workers, and I feel like one could learn a lot by the narrative that he presented. Um, which was not mythic by any chance in, in his church. Yeah, but I, I think I'm talking about what influences mm -hmm. the moment itself and right. where people do. Uh, and, and the other point I was going to make, yeah. or the other question I was going to raise with some hesitation about your point about mythic, is that this uprising was, to the extent that there was a message that kept coming out, and I think I feel like it came out of what Union Coalition, you know, the strong we are Wisconsin group, was to de emphasize the creation of charismatic leadership and to insist actually upon a sort of plainness of the charisma of the Midwest. Just plain folks. We, we, we uh, fish through ice. And, and nobody who fishes through ice is very famous. They're out there freezing, but they're getting, you know. So, but the, the point I'm also making in this is that there were opportunities, and I was surprised by virtue of some of my own participation that, for example, when the 14 senators were coming back from Rockford, there wasn't a caravan <laughs> with them that, that TV wanted to focus on their cars from the moment they left Rockford to the moment they arrived here. There was a de-emphasis of that, and even to the point where several of the senators were not invited to speak at the next major event. They had the huge event, but by April, when there were events that were sustaining events, they were expressly excluded. So, and that was partly because there, there was to be no crowning of that character type. So, Meaning of re rebels? I think, well, yeah, I mean, there weren't necessarily rebels. There might have been one or two who could have been crowned in that group, and they have, I, I think, been, yeah, I mean, whatever the case, there was an intentionality, I think, about dropping off of that story of creation of myth. That may be wrong, but that's my, that's certainly from a closer level, that's an impression, and it was, it effectively was carried, it effectively worked in part, or it happened in part, because there weren't really even journalists at the old, at the level of a collective voice that were producing that narrative. Uh, with all due respect to, to 
to those who have celebrated the positive aspects of the uprising. I think that another narrative has been almost completely faced, and that is uh, what other strategy and tactics could have been adopted uh, by the union leadership and by the uh, the energized rank and file of the labor movement and their con considerable community allies mm -hmm. other than and there was a partial occupation of the capital. That was a form of direct action. But everything else was mm -hmm. just a big series of parades around the capital, uh, which Walker understood the, the union leadership wasn't going to go any further than that. And he, he very wisely waited them out. And, and so where is the analysis about the efficacy of taking the movement off the streets you know, into the recall effort where predictably the plutocrats and the Walker gang, you know, mm -hmm. beat, you know, the underfunded <coughs> labor movement and the underfunded Wisconsin Democratic Party. And mm -hmm. uh, there were others, uh, you know, during the uprising who called for direct action, more militant forms of direct action. There was the slogan of the general strike, which kind of took on a kind of Sorellian you know, existence, and those of us who raised the slogan of the general strike, of course, didn't think that there could be a, a real general strike, you know, like right. they had in France or, or Italy, but right. it became kind of a code word for, you know, there needs to be s some public worker strike, there needs to be job actions, and there needs to be, you know, a nonviolent civil disobedience, blockade the, you know, the streets, mm -hmm. occupy the whole capital, whatever, and I think that that's the narrative that, you know, and, and with all of like this, the, the way the Eighth of El CIO leadership has celebrated this film, we, you know, that Amy uh, Williams has done, which shows the inspiring aspects of the ordinary citizen mobilization. I think it's being used in a way to camouflage the fact that they have led the labor movement mm -hmm. in Wisconsin and nationally mm -hmm. to defeat. Right. To defeat. So, what do you think? My question is, what do you think would be the material and symbolic conditions in w under which a large numbers of, of of Americans would begin to think in terms of a, of a more effective strategy? The question I think is, what would have what would it have taken in Wisconsin to for that to have happened? That is, to not what what were what were the forces pushing back against that channeling of conflict into controlled areas? Um, I mean, one would want to do a more sort of systematic look at, you know, who came together um, in response to that attempt to channel, to that attempt to, in a sense, bureaucratize or uh, enable the bureaucratic tendencies to, uh, you know, that you say that, uh, that Walker was completely aware of, that he knew that there were limits that the labor movement would not go beyond. Um, yeah. well, yes, and I mean, I think Walker would have been happy if uh, people started trashing the capital and sure, you could have used it. I mean, if anything that would have created a legitimate repression would have been welcomed. So the issue of whether moving to a disruptive form of direct action, either in the sense of property damage, that's one, one form, or in the sense of uh, really much broader civil disobedience that would have disrupted temporarily things whether that would have had more symbolic payoff than the symbolic payoff of such a civic action that was, <coughs> that was um, standing up in the name of democracy and civility against... Which was what? How do you, which was what? That is the... That's not certainly not the sit-down in the Capitol. No, it's the, 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 the whole... The occupation, the sit down in the Capitol has as its slogan, whose house is this, it's our house. Mm -hmm. They were very concerned not to damage the place. There was cooperation right. with the janitors and all this stuff. Yep. I, would, I, I lectured in um, Athens, Greek, Greece about the, you know, their kind of slideshow and show and tell about the Wisconsin stuff. And um, I told them the slogan, you know, whose house, the call and response, whose house is this, it's our house, and all that stuff. And people were just shocked that the response of the people weren't once they got inside the building to trash it. Now that's what they would have done. They said we would have put graffiti all <laughs> over the walls and, and 
Um, and I said, we, you know, and the spirit here was, it's our house, why would we put graffiti over it? You know, it's, it's reclaiming democracy, which still, sh you know, it was a symbolic affirmation that there was something to reclaim, which, so it's, it, it isn't so obvious that the, the robust payoff for, for durable myth-making of a sort that would sustain a movement would have been better with a more disruptive strategy. Now, that's the counterfactual. Would it have produced more of a sense of civic cohesion, of broad-based mass support outside of the circle of people who are directly involved, or would it almost instantly have led to a complete fragmentation of the movement, where you have demonstrations of 10,000 people rather than 100,000 people? Uh, I think the political climate was such that a escalation to a more disruptive thing would have ended it. Would not have been a, a, a building block towards, you know, who knows? I mean, that's my, my counterfactual is that that would not have had the symbolically empowering effect. It would have turned it on itself almost immediately. Have you looked at the student uprising in Quebec? Yeah. Because what I understand of that, uh, first of all, it was sustained, uh, somewhat like here, it engaged a whole lot of people. They were successful on basically all of their demands. Uh, the tuition was not increased. Mm -hmm. Basically, the overthrow of the government came out of that. Mm -hmm. And I understand that it wasn't just a spontaneous response to the threat of tuition increase. That movement had been building for a number of years. And I've read one study that suggests that one in five people in the province of Quebec were in the streets at some point. A figure so stunning that I can only doubt it. But whatever it was, there was something more there, far more inclusive and far more effective. And I think that that, that might be a contrast uh, with the Wisconsin yes. uprising that might be fruitful. I was going to say, I mean, nationalism plays an important role in that. And, uh, the tendencies, you know, the Quebec Party, the dominant party in Quebec, is, is you know, the, um, the FLQ, the, not the FLQ. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, they're not, um, they're, they're not relevant. Well, no, only in the sense that there's a lot of there's have also been a lot of opposition to those kind of neoliberal practices yes. among the ruling yes. party. I'm not sure that that's a nationalism uh, movement because it, this was a protest within Quebec about Quebec. No, I know. So the, the fact that it was Quebec against the rest of Canada, that, that's not a, a piece of, that fits in this particular equation. I think in terms of mass movements and successful protests mm -hmm. and building solidarity mm -hmm. um, intergenerationally as well as, as uh, across groups, I think there's been probably a lot there we need to be mining. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, you know, the same in some ways in France when, probably. you know, over the years, the network punctuates kind of political space in France are these uprisings that we hear about, general strikes that often generalize themselves to uh, students and, and others, and they uh, typically have 65% you know, of the population <laughs> in support when they do polls, and you know, who knows how reasonable that is. Wisconsin had about 65%, that was at the end Here? of the day, That's about, that was about the ratio, wasn't it? In terms of supporting the demands of the mm -hmm. protests, about 65%. We're here? Yeah. What happens, do you think? So in the statewide, you mean statewide, statewide, statewide. Yeah. Isn't that surprising, though? That's, I mean, it's, that's quite high. Yeah. Um, what happened to that, do you think? I mean, why did it lose? Yeah, it wasn't discredited for the reasons that you're suggesting. No, so could seven, have been. I think, to me, the most telling statistic about the recall election itself was that 17% of the people who voted against recalling Walker said they planned to vote for Obama the following November but they did not think the recall was legitimate on the grounds that elections are the way we settle these matters. No, uh, Walker hadn't done criminal act, you know, criminal activity. Right. Uh, I mean, one can argue more metaphorically it was a crime, but, you know, in no, the right. sense of, um, and although it, it's true that he hadn't campaigned on a, I'm going to destroy the unions, he had definitely campaigned as a right winger. <laughs> you know, it's not, so it's true, like all politicians, he didn't necessarily show all of his hands, but so a lot of people, I mean enough, 17% was way more than the margin, were people who, as they proved in November, they did vote for Obama. So the mix of voting for Walker in June and Obama in December, and the most effective ads on television were 
ads that said, uh, uh, people said, I'm a Democrat, I voted for Obama, but the recall is wrong. That's not how we settle things. You know? mm -hmm. And the, the billboards that said um, that these were spoiled, you know, Madison spoiled brats, basically. Is that how it was framed? Yeah, I forget the word. Was it spoil? <coughs> uh, spo uh, spoil sports. You know, they lost the election. They can't stomach it, so they're going to have a recall. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that was enough to to, diffuse, I mean, to uh, I think that's that, that was the tactic that won was the anti, not the pro. It wasn't pro Walker. It was just against the idea of recall. Was the thing that uh, wasn't counter to that. But yeah. this would be whether he will be reelected right. in 2016. And Walker will? Whether right. he, would be, he would be reelected or not. And it, to me, it looks like he will be, judging by the original polling that I heard of. And so that's. Well, it's awfully early to know what. Yes, going. yes, of course. Yeah, it's still. Yeah, there's, no, there's no Democratic candidate even being. But the, about yeah, him. but that's, that's probably the reason why he will be and why he lost the, I mean, he won the recall, too. So. Mm -hmm. have, 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 have somebody more credible been running yeah, against Yeah, find all the decided to run. No, yeah. it's Tom Barrett's fault. <laughs> <laughs> Blame Tom Barrett. Seriously, as architect. I was there. But there's another point, and, and that is, so labor has been instrumental in electing Democrats from time to time. Mm -hmm. So what? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, where was Obama in yeah, Wisconsin? Yeah. I mean, he played no role, was he? Uh, that was telling, it seems. Yeah. Well, do you think, so I'm going to address this as a question direct, but it's in response to some of the things yeah, that were said Because I don't know these elections. dynamics. Yeah, so. Sure, well, but, it, but, you can't, but elections in general mm -hmm. are between two candidates. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not, the recall was not in the California style, yes or no, recall the person, and then there's an election between candidates. It was mm -hmm. him and a specific challenger. Mm -hmm. And it was run on specific issues. For the most part, they were not about the uh, law that was Act 10, the, the the union, the unions were not the main focus of that campaign, and probably will not be in twenty four, in the in the sixteenth, in the next election. We'll see, uh, twenty fourteen. Thanks and getting that election mixed up. Um, so symbolically speaking, are what's the role of elections? Can we think of them as ratifications of particular policies, or are they? What? How do they relate to movements? Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Um, you know, in, sense, in some sense, elections are moving things outside of the realm where there's some possibility of control um, by, uh, by a rank and file to a situation where the political system is able to kind of ratify its, itself in a way. So, uh, you know, it's, it's depressing, but it's, um, I mean, just if you think of the, uh, you know, what just in the last months what Republicans have been able to do in state houses across the country in terms of um, you know, slicing and dicing the electorate and the voting process. Um, uh, it's not as it's though Democrats have been. I mean, Democrats, Democrats were elected. Obama didn't come to, to Madison, but you wouldn't have. I, we didn't expect that, really, right? Um, that's not what he sees his role. I mean, his role was to administer, and in a in a way that's you know has some progressive possibilities and openings, but not to mo mobilize at that level labor. I mean, I don't feel as though that labor has that position in the Democratic Party any longer. You know, they're sort of a, a junior sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're used to, they provide people on the ground to help with the national elections and they provide uh, some financial uh, support. But beyond that, it's not as though um, the Democratic Party is n clearly not a party of labor in any sense. I mean, there is no space for labor, really. Um, that I see, yeah. Maybe you feel different. Uh, uh, just to finish off your point, though, I have another thing. Uh, nationally, maybe statewide, yes. I think I would agree. Mm -hmm. Locally, I would disagree. Mm -hmm. I would say that if you look at the Dane Dems, um, and you look at local <coughs> politicians running for city councils and school it's true. boards. That's true. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm just speaking from my very first-hand in-depth knowledge of that, that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of support there, mm -hmm. county board, yeah. right. these local races. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of friends in the Democratic Party that are there, mm -hmm. speaking as a practitioner. Mm -hmm. 
myself. Well, that's true in Massachusetts as well. I agree. Right. Yeah. Uh, how to translate that? I tell my membership just don't even pay attention to national politics because they'll get you mm -hmm. mad. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I should probably clarify my remarks um, about Tom Barrett. Um, no, Tom He's Barrett lost of, in 2010. Uh, because I, I campaigned harder for Tom Barrett in 2010 than he did. And that's the reason that we, and when we lost in a redistricting year, that set up this whole can of worms that we're going to be dealing with for many years now. And when he came back and waited until the very last minute when there was no opportunity to set up a statewide organization that was going to be able to seriously get whatever candidate elected and jumped in at the last minute in the primaries and wiped out work that uh, Kathleen Falk actually won those counties up north that people said she couldn't win, that Barrett didn't get. And so he, he undermined the effort by doing what he did, and he should be on Scott Walker's Christmas list. Um, and so, but my question that I wanted to ask you today as a practitioner has to do with destroying myths there's an oppositional myth to the myth that, that you were talking about today mm -hmm. in, your, in your talk, mm -hmm. and that comes from the managerial class, the corporate class, of mm -hmm. who basically have a myth that they project where unions, you know, there's union bosses, union thugs, uh, union communists, uh, socialists, um, you know, that myth, I want to know how I can bust that because when I've got to recruit a new member in these tough times to pay their union dues and sign their union card, if, if you've got some ideas for me on how to bust those oppositional myths, bust them. Well, they certainly have a powerful myth-making apparatus, but um, unions haven't done themselves favors in a lot of industries. It's almost like saying you know, P. Huntington's class of civilizations, <laughs> which I don't agree with any of what he says, but it's I, a very it's a very powerful mm -hmm. paradigm that's mm -hmm. out there. Mm -hmm. I mean look, I think union leadership and its relationship to its members is its own set of problems and in some sense it's seeded the ground to these myths to to a large degree in many places. Um, you know, unions have not, over many decades, had to, until recent, fairly recently, been able, they have not had this kind of, um, they've not been in this kind of situation. So, you know, there's a whole dimension of labor leadership uh, that was not um, so interested in mobilizing the membership. Um, it didn't need to. It didn't, you know, it had, a, it, it, could, it could every three years go and settle the contract. Um, with some benefits without having to mobilize the membership. You know, that's the whole, remember the story of the, the dues checkoff that they're trying to go after now um, was set in place and had an effect. On the one hand, it made it possible to facilitate the organization of the union, but it also meant that the <coughs> for generations, labor leaders never had to go and sell unionism to the workers and mobilize workers and allow them to participate in that process. So, I, mean, I don't blame current generation of labor leaders for that, but that's what's been inherited. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has opened the ground, created open ground for these kind of anti-union myths that mm -hmm. the right and uh, corporations spin. Um, so how do you counter that? Um, mobilize your membership. Mobilize, you know, yeah, we'll create structures to mobilize the membership, to have them participate in, 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 mm -hmm. uh, in processes at the union. You know, I was in, in, in the Molders Union once for a while, you know, and um, nobody showed up at the meetings, you know? A handful of people showed up at the meetings. What kind of democracy could we demand? I mean, uh, and uh, so, you know, I don't know how you get from here to there now. Mm -hmm. At this point, you know, there's, for, for the reasons we've talked about, you know, unions are absolutely on the defensive. They're organizations that the only organizations that working class people have in America for the most part that I, you know, other than these organizations that I mentioned earlier, which are not unions, they are, they operate in the space between unions and community and religious organizations, and they get some of their strength from that. They're not committed, 
they don't have to negotiate contracts, and that's a, you know, they, so they can't, in a sense, advance people's interests in the same way, but they can play an important advocacy role. Um, I think unions can learn a lot from them, too. We are doing a lot of community reach out. You know, it yeah. occurs to me that you know, prior to the, the, the advent of the CIO style union organization, mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of mutual aid societies that came into being sure. in this country, yep. uh, mutuality, yep. Uh, yep. and that seemed to be a good organizing model. Is you know, what's the <coughs> efficacy of that yep. in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, yeah. Pilot projects. <laughs> no, we got to try things and we try are. things and boldly and you know break from tradition and try things out and see what's going what's what's working. That's what some of these foundations are involved with with these grassroots groups is having you know is working with them to kind of try organizing models. Some work better than others. Some work in certain circumstances. Uh, the, the, let's face it. Um, uh, the labor movement can do the, the trade union movement could be doing the same thing, you know. Uh, where's you know the, the organizing department in uh, Washington now? You know, it's terrible what's happened. You know, and after '95, you know there was this kind of attempt at renovation, you know, and really quite dynamic leaders, Richard Benzinger, I'm thinking of, and others who were willing to break all the models. Um, you know, they've been squeezed out, it seems, and that's a real problem at the top. Um, the question is, you know, is there that possibility of innovation at the local level? I think it's hard. I think it's hard. But it's, uh, uh, got to try things because there's not, not much, uh, um, uh, the labor movement dies if we stay in, in this, it, it dies. And if it dies, um, it's not clear to me what happens um, with the possibilities for any kind of uh, working class voice in America or beyond. It's just, you know, not that unions provided, have provided much of a voice, but um, they've been there as some sort of, some support, and I think we're in a really dire situation for that. Um, and, you know, so I don't know, you, you know more about the dynamics of who you work with, and you can look around the room when you're there and say, you know, are these people willing to break from these traditional ways and open it up? There's been some opening up since 95 for sure, um, but I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, Thomas Koken, the uh, economist, has written a little about some interesting things about how, you know, even if the labor movement, SEIU and some of the more dynamic organizing unions, could be successful, even moderately, it's still not going to replace the power that has been lost um, over the last decade, decades. Um, that is, other new forms of organizing and New forms of organization, I think, are essential. It is a power yeah. dynamic, and that's what can't be forgotten. Yeah. It's a power relationship. But it's not clear to me that um, many of the traditional unions are capable of dealing with their relative powerlessness now. That is, I think it requires something, new ingredients somehow. And that's what I'm, I don't know, I don't have a, you know, crystal ball, but yeah. I don't see how the labor movement has a prayer if it doesn't challenge the, the hegemonic capitalist theory. Okay? I mean, we have a situation of, especially since the 2008 crash when the banks were bailed out, right? right? Yep. Or homeowners weren't bailed out. Yep. We have a situation of outrageous exploitation and austerity. It's yep. just flagrant. Look at what happened mm -hmm. last week with J.P. Morgan. Yep. Flagrant. I know. Okay, and it seems to me that you, there has to be a, a, a popular counter narrative developed. So la labor would have to explain what is wrong with the, the, the corporate capitalist system. But it cannot do that as long as it's politically subordinate to a wing of the corporate ruling class represented to yes. the Democratic Party. So it basically but gives a Republican light kind of narrative. It's true, except you know? this labor movement also produced a guy, people like Stephen Lerner, in that new kind of wave. And Stephen Lerner, you know, I, and I've been in a, in a kind of small forum and uh, listening to him, and we talked about, you know, this is a few years ago now, um, uh, these kind of, in a sense, galvanizing actions that could grab the attention and build upon it. Huh? And, um, and that included, um, literally, when I say occupying Wall Street, 
I mean occupying the stock market and closing it down for a day and the impact that that would have internationally um, uh, and uh, a series of actions that might and you know he and others were willing to are willing to sort of think through those things um, so I agree with you in terms of the general politics of the Democratic Party and the labor movement in relation to it but I think within it it's a broad movement with a fair amount of differential participation and uh, ideological uh, difference within it and the question is breaking f I mean I don't know I don't have a, I wish I could say this is a path you know but I think innovation and pilot projects are essential to kind of shake up um, the ways that things have been done um, uh, that's how you create on some level a new narrative by new actions that work in different ways and uh, you know so I would look for it an AFL-CIO that cultivates that with its money and its time and its, uh, you know, and I, well, there's some of that that happens, but certainly not enough to counter this incredible shift we've seen. I want to grab just a couple of points and I, I have to run, but when come up to Derek said, I thought, you know, come back to this question of what, what the narrative was and where it went in mm. the direction of labor versus where it went in the direction of the political parties. And I, I do feel sort of strongly that uh, the moment where things were happening, uh, the collaboration between students and janitors, I mean, that's the stuff of the story and the narrative, and it's what people are writing about. But my view is that there was something really uh, disappointingly lost in that very process, and I can't figure it out. I actually think that to some extent, the students here have to be held to respond to this because they did such a great job in organizing essentially a mash unit of emergency response within the Capitol and creating a cell within the Capitol. And yet, there was a moment where when the occupation of the Capitol was sort of chaotically ending, um, that the, the, chance to, the chance to make a certain kind of statement um, I don't know where it went. It would have been a Port Huron-like moment. But what I'm thinking is that that local one, and I say this as a writer and somebody who's trying to write this up now, but also as policy, but the, the, the janitor's union in the Capitol is, is local one of Aspen. I mean, that's, it's not just local one because it's local one. It's the very first local of the very first public sector union in the United States. So. The question is, how could that opportunity, in terms of the relationship between the students and everybody else in the capital and that union, not in itself have led to a, a kind of practical connection, which is to say, if I were to ask you, Eric, if any of the students, your students or others, sought to organize that local in that capital and made a point to say that we, we, are, we have done nothing if we don't ensure that that local of janitors is supplemented, that the contracting out of janitors is, is stopped, that the very first opportunity to grow unionism from local one back out can happen. And the fact of the matter is that's been attempted and it has, it has failed in part because nobody has engaged with local one. I can assure you. What do you mean engaged with? In, in terms of the practical aspects of saying that this is where we were. We were in the rotunda. The garbage workers, you know, for God's sake, the other public sector labor narrative in this country is Martin Luther King's assassination at the public sector workers' strike in Memphis. So there's no better connective tissue than that one. So there's, I, I just pose it as a question and as a challenge because I, I think it's still there to be, to be cultivated. The other thing is that this question of whether politics uh, you know, this, this, this question of whether the public was not voting for collective bargaining as they were, you know, supporting 65 to 70 percent of what was happening in the uprising, and yet they didn't vote Walker out of the recall, and your point was because they felt that the political process didn't justify recall. And the thing that has to be countered or weighed against it just in the, our own study of this and where we go is that when it came to a formalist position of the Democratic Party versus what the unions could have done, the question then was whether to throw it all in to educate and stay with the issue that had people 
animated during the uprising and insist that we are going to fall or we're going to succeed on the basis of educa further education on the labor issue along with everything else? Or do we abandon that issue because the polling that we're getting, and this is key to this, anybody who's in the unions knows that the reason that that issue was not emphasized was for classical party reasons, which was that the polling they were doing sure. said it wasn't deep enough to, to keep people in. In fact, yep. the more that you reference the collective bargaining issue or public sector workers, the more likely you are to lose. And I think that that was a tragic misreading of, the, of, of what was both happening and then of the very point, of the principal point, of whether you live or die on your goods. You've got the question before you of whether you're going to, if you fail at educating the public at this, and you are and you don't win, okay. But if you don't try it, and you don't win, then what you've said is that the labor issue wasn't significant enough to, you know, to basically put the right. principles to I test. have to make a contribution to what you just said. I was in Milwaukee. We interviewed, like I said, I'm a practitioner. We interviewed every leading Democrat in the state of Wisconsin to recruit who was going to run and who we were going to endorse. Of all three combined public employee councils from AFSCME in the state of Wisconsin, which is a heck of a lot, this it was a rare thing for us all even to get together in the same room. And we interviewed every, and we came out with none of them, not a one, not think of a leading light in the, in the Democratic Party in the state of Wisconsin. None of them. Tom Barrett was somewhere in Kansas, couldn't even send an om ombudsman to talk to us. <clears throat> Kathleen Falk showed up, Kathleen Beinault showed up, and both of them said that they would veto the budget. Hell yes, is what Kathleen Beinault said, because that was the only way to get it back into the political system in with the legislature, with the dynamics of, of the rules of the the state house. Other than that, no, no, nobody would step up. Nobody would take take up the challenge. But why would you expect <clears throat> Democratic Party politicians to take up the cause of labor in that way? That is, it has to come from the labor movement itself. Any of that, what right. you're calling for, is this sort of this. Yeah, and well, I agree. No, I guess I that process of education could have gone on right there. Expected that. What's that? I think you misread me if, if you think I expected that. Oh. I think I was trying to report that hmm. information. No, but I mean, why would anyone expect them to take up this, in a, in a sense, this different style of politics? The style of politics that they work in is within the confines of the, these rules and this system. And I guess what would have, if what you're saying is correct, and I think it, was, it is, <laughs> that. Uh, a kind of non-parliamentary politics has to be developed, right? That that doesn't look to, I mean, it's a problem. I mean, you need uh, you need to sort of understand the way the system operates, but you also need to operate without it. And I don't see what social forces, and I just don't know Wisconsin at all, would have been available to move this discussion outside of the political realm and take it up on the basis of its strength. Its strength was collective action for a short time. Um, where is the strength after that when that wanes? Um, and you know, who would have, what social forces would have been able to, to carry that on? Um, I mean, I can't say just because I don't know.